This is The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires in Baltimore. It is a decisive victory in India for the BJP and Narendra Modi. But what should now Indians be looking out for in the coming days and years? Joining us to analyze the situation is Nagesh Rao. Nagesh Rao is a lecturer of University Studies at Colgate University. He's a scholar of post-colonial studies and an activist in the anti-war movement. He's also spent a year teaching in India, and he joins us today from Colgate University. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So, Nagesh, start with what happened in India. Well, to start with, I think we have to see that this is a very difficult um, time for most Indians. Uh, going into this election, uh, the media and um, the uh, corporate sector in India had already anointed Narendra Modi prime minister well before the voting had begun. And the candidate of corporate capital and of um, a Hindu nationalist right-wing movement is now uh, poised to become prime minister. Um, as you probably know, uh, Narendra Modi is, of course, most notorious for the fact that he, at the very least, didn't do anything uh, to stop the pogroms against Muslims in Gujarat in 2002. Um, and uh, he's seen as a very divisive uh, and authoritarian figure for many of these reasons. Nagesh, so the uh, Nagesh Modi's Hindu fundamentalism history, and in, even in terms of enticing violence of the past, has been exposed. Uh, many people talked about it during these elections. However, in this particular electoral platform, he was running on... Uh, an anti-corruption platform um, and also, a, you know, a job creation platform. Is that not so? Yes, except that um, the the way he talks about the he, the way he's talked about these real, real issues has been in terms of um, so-called development. Uh, looking at the Gujarat model, as it's been called, as Chief Minister of Gujarat, he has uh, he claims to have developed Gujarat. Um, uh, in a way that no other state has in India, and he hopes to implement that same model across uh, the country. Uh, the thing to recognize is that Modi's um, sort of reinvention, uh, uh, his reinvention as a developmentalist, as someone who's going to uh, focus primarily on jobs, the economy, and so on and so forth, um, has been fairly recent in origin uh, because of his success in Gujarat. Uh, sections of corporate capital uh, anointed him precisely because they want to see um, all the barriers towards capital accumulation in India lifted. Um, so further neoliberalism, further privatization, further deregulation, uh, this is what lurks behind the, the model of development that's known as the Gujarat model. Um, that, said, that said, I think it's important to recognize that the communalist fundamentalist element of uh, Modi's uh, being wasn't entirely forgotten during this campaign. And uh, he, he and his allies uh, have done as much as they could to both emphasize this Gujarat model of development on the one hand, but also kind of Hindu nationalism and fundamentalism on the other. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the other parties did? It, it appears that none of the other parties did very well, given the sweep that BJP had. That's right. I mean, uh, you know, one of the uh, sort of uh, promising new entrants to the electoral scene was the Aam Admi Party, the Ordinary Man's Party, the Common Man's Party, uh, which people were expecting would do, uh, would at least, uh, you know, have some sort of showing, but it hasn't done that well. The parliamentary left, uh, led by the CPI and CPIM, have similarly uh, done pretty badly. Um, at the same time, if you look at the vote shares, what you find is that the BJP uh, essentially has, has received about 32, 35% of the vote. Uh, because of the first past the post electoral system, this, is kind, this kind of skews things a little bit because our perspective, because uh, if you look at the vote share, it really tells us that about, you know, uh, a, a solid majority of the Indian ele electorate did not vote for the BJP. So there's that element to be uh, taken into account as well. Uh, how is that so? Explain that a little bit more. 
Um, that's because the BJP, uh, you know, so far uh, it's it's uh, it's vote tally uh, in in the in terms of the number of seats, it's mm -hmm. clearly won a majority. But in terms of uh, what percentage of the electorate voted for it, it appears to be about 32 to 35 percent, um, which means uh, that there's a significant chunk of the electorate that voted for other parties. But because of the first past the post system that we have, um, the BJP with uh, 35 percent of the vote uh, gets to form the next uh, governments. In other words, it's not a uh, uh, it's not a system of proportional. Uh, uh, proportional representation, but a first past the post system. So, um, by virtue of having the greatest number of uh, seats now, they will form the government. But in terms of their mandate, we have to see that large numbers of people voted for other parties. While we recognize the immense uh, outpouring of resentment against the status quo, against the UPA government, the Congress-led UPA government, its corruption, its nepotism, and so on. And while we see the frustration uh, against the status quo moving towards the BJP and giving the BJP this massive victory, we shouldn't forget that at the same time, um, a number of changes have taken place in the last two, three, four years that have uh, galvanized whole sections of the population and politicized them in ways uh, uh, that are uh, fairly significant. Uh, the high voter turnout this in this election is, I think, an index of that. Uh, something like two thirds of the electorate voted, uh, which is uh, higher than the last uh, election, and I think it's probably the highest it's been in a long time. So um, there is, in, in other words, there's a contradictory sort of situation here. On the one hand, you have this right-wing fundamentalist. Uh, movement with organized fascists uh, sort of waiting in the wings. On the other hand, you have a, a degree of politicization among urban youth and among the middle classes and among uh, large sections of the population that um, uh, could potentially speak to other sorts of uh, political uh, expressions emerging in the coming months and years. Uh, Nagesh, finally, what will this mean in terms of a functioning democracy uh, in parliament? Um, will the left be able to, um, you know, put up a, uh, a fair fight in, in the Lok Sabha? Well, you know, frankly, in terms of the parliamentary left, we have to say that uh, it has hardly functioned as an opposition, even when it had some power. Um, the parliamentary left, uh, meaning the left front led by the CPI and CPIM, um, have themselves embraced many of the policies of neoliberalism, special economic zones, and so on and so forth, which is why they were trounced in the previous elections and haven't done well in these elections either. I think if any opposition is to come, the opposition will come from outside of the parliamentary bodies, will come from people's movements, uh, from anti-nuclear protesters, from uh, people standing up against uh, the deprivations of um, neoliberalism. Uh, there are a number of militant workers' movements that are emerging, particularly in the auto plants in the Delhi NCR region. Uh, there's, there's a new sort of militancy in the unions there. There's also anti-nuclear protests in Gujarat, in, in Tamil Nadu, and so on which have the potential of bringing back and reinventing a sense of participatory democracy through mass mobilization and protest. But the problem is, of course, that the, the organized expression of these protests is very weak. So when it comes to you know, how democracy will function, the first thing we have to say is that uh, democracy under the UPA government has already been seriously weakened. If you think about the corruption scams, if you think about the degree of repression uh, that's been meted out to pr protest movements and resistance movements, even under the UPA-led government, uh, it doesn't bode well for what an authoritarian, intolerant uh, leadership like Modi's might achieve. This is the beginning of, I think, very exciting times. Um, we want to quickly get a report out on, on what happened and what people can be looking out for. However, we will continue the analysis, um, and uh, we are hoping that you'll come back on The Real News and uh, report to us on these great um, social movements that are budding.
I would love to. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on the Real News Network. Thank you.